Hello and welcome back. This is Matt Crump. We are in the first learning module for Psych 2530. And this one is about how to read primary research articles. And we're going to be talking about the Calmery method. There is an associated reading for this. You can check it out in the textbook. It's in section 1.9. So read that and follow along here. This is a pretty short lecture talk a little bit about why it's important to learn how to read primary research and cognition, and then we'll dive into the Calmery method for doing so. So as a general point, the textbook in this course will give you a bird's eye view about various domains in cognition, but it will sacrifice a little bit of depth. So sometimes in the course, we will find opportunities to go into the details by reading individual articles published in cognitive journals. Now, reading primary research articles is a general course goal I have for all students. And uh, this is a first step towards helping you develop skills to read and interpret these kinds of things. So how to read journal articles. If you've ever tried to do this, you might have found that the article was confusing. I remember when I first started learning about cognition and reading papers. I didn't really know what they were about. It was hard to read. It took forever. And the language was confusing. I didn't know what the questions were. I didn't know how to interpret the results. It is a skill that takes some time and effort to develop, but it does pay off. We're going to talk about the Calmery method as a kind of general set of tips for extracting critical components, conceptual components, out of research papers. This is an acronym. It stands for question, alternatives, logic, methods, results, and inference. These are all important pieces of individual research articles. So to use the Calmery method, we need an example paper. I've chosen one for us to read. It happens to be a paper that I published, so I'm already familiar with it. It was published in 2010. The title is Warning, This Keyboard Will Deconstruct, The Role of the Keyboard in Skilled Typewriting. It was published in a journal called the Psychonomic Bulletin and Review. You can click this link, and that will take you to the journal homepage where you can access the manuscript. You can download the PDF. So here's the paper. We'll scan through this in a moment. And if you've been following along, you'll know that this paper is about typing on keyboards. Let's check out the paper and see what it's all about. So before we start using the Calmery method to help us understand this paper, I'm just gonna scan through this with you. You can see there's a title, we've got an abstract, the purpose of the abstract is to provide a short amount of text that somebody could read quickly in order to glean the most important aspects of the paper. So they should be able to figure out what the purpose of the paper is, what the question was, what the results were, what the implications of the results are, all in this one little abstract. After the abstract, we have an introduction. In this case, it's not particularly long. It's about a page and a half. And the introduction sets up the context for the research, talks about any background research that might have been done. And it should also explain what the research question was, what issues are at stake in this article. Then we see an experiment one section. There's a little paragraph after that that explains the details of experiment one. And then we have a method section tells us about who participated in this experiment? What kind of tools and apparatus and design were used? What kind of task was used? What, what were people doing in this task? After the methods are explained, we now see some results. So this is the findings of the study. There's also a section called results. This paper happens to have two experiments. So these basic pieces repeat themselves. There's an experiment two. There's an introduction to the second experiment. A much shorter method section, 
and again a results section saying what happened. Here's an example of um, how some of these things can be confusing if you're unfamiliar with them. So what does this mean? This is a whole bunch of statistical information about the results of this paper. Finally, after the results of the entire set of experiments have been reported, there's usually a general discussion section that the authors use to uh, summarize in general what was found and talk about the inferences and conclusions they made and maybe also talk about limitations or avenues for future directions. So they talk about what all this stuff means. At the very end of a paper, you'll often find a list of references. These are previous research manuscripts that have been published that the authors brought into their manuscript when they wrote it. So there's five pages of stuff here. And I think if anyone was to try to read this paper, you know, it's a good question. If you are a total novice and you don't know anything about cognition or psychology, would this paper make sense? I'm not so sure. I don't know if I wrote it that well for a general audience. And that's why it can be useful to use the Calmry method uh, to help you identify the major things you're trying to figure out about the paper. A first major thing is the question. Research begins with a question, and the point of the research is to answer the question. So this paper probably is asking some questions. You should be able to go and read the introduction to find out what kinds of questions are being asked. Now, there might be several questions. And one way to think about the questions and to organize them is to think about them in terms of big questions and specific questions. So this paper asks is about some big questions and it's also about some very specific questions. Big questions usually take many experiments and papers to answer. And it's usually the case that a, an individual research article um, is in addition to considering big questions, it's attempting to address or answer very specific smaller questions that are the focus of that research. So we're not going to jump into the paper and try to identify the components at this point, but I'll let you know that some of the big questions in that paper were, how do people control their own body movements? If you think about the ability to type on a keyboard, um, how, how is it that you're able to move your hands in the first place? That's a big question about cognition. Here's a slightly more specific, but also a big question. How do people learn to type, especially do it so fast that they don't even have to think about what their fingers are doing while they're typing? If you've spent a lot of time typing on a computer key keyboard, you might be able to sit there and just like, you know, type your email or whatever without even thinking about where your fingers are moving. So how can you do that automatically? And what's involved? What kind of cognitive process is enabling that kind of skill? Now, I'll tell you right now, my research paper does not answer any of those big questions. It just wiggles the toe of the big typing monster. Instead, this paper is focused on a more specific question. This specific question is, how does tactile feedback from the keyboard influence typing performance? And that means um, when people are typing and the, they're touching the keys, how does the touching the keys influence typing performance? Does it matter? Does it not matter? Why would I want to ask a specific question like that? These questions are related to alternatives. This is the second letter in Calmry. Now, alternatives refer to different ways of explaining something, alternative hypotheses or alternative explanations. Experiments, especially in research articles, commonly consider at least two alternative hypotheses. And this isn't always the case, 
sometimes you'll find a research paper where they are only considering one alternative. But in general, especially in cognition, there's usually multiple possibilities for how something could happen. So when you're reading through a paper, try to identify what are the alternative ideas being discussed by the authors and how do they relate to the questions. So for example, in my paper, um, we can jump over here and sort of scroll down and let's see if I can zoom in. and highlight, here's a sentence. Re recent research from our laboratory has challenged the idea that an explicit cognitive map of key locations is precise enough to support accurate typing. So what does that mean? This sentence is alluding to one of the alternative explanations of typing ability. And I will try to extract that and rephrase it to have it make a little bit more sense. Here's one way of talking about it. And again, we're considering questions about whether touching the keyboard, feeling the keyboard is helpful for typing or not. So here's an idea. People might have an internal cognitive map of the keyboard. The cognitive map would represent the location of the keys on the keyboard, and you might use that internal mind map to direct your fingers to appropriate locations while you're typing. All right, so if I'm trying to explain things like, how is it that I can type really quickly without even thinking about it? How do my fingers know where to go? One, one general idea is that, well, I've developed some kind of map of the keyboard in my head and even when my eyes are closed, somehow that map is telling my fingers where to go. And it does it so efficiently and so quickly that I don't even need to think about it. My map knows and it tells me how to move my fingers. That, that's a kind of idea. Now, an implication of this idea is that this cognitive map that I'm using should be able to plan finger movements, it should be able to send my fingers to different places without needing feedback from what my fingers are actually doing. And if that's true, maybe I don't need to feel the keyboard. If I didn't have a keyboard and I just could somehow do air typing, I would be able to type just fine because my map knows where my fingers need to go. This is the first alternative. And we could come up with more. We come up with a second one. We could come up with lots more. Let's come up with a second one. Here's a different kind of idea. When you think about what you had to go through to learn how to type, you know, at first it was slow and you were looking for things like, where is this? Uh, where's that? You know, where's this or that? And you get faster with practice. Now, every time you interact with your keyboard, maybe you're learning associations between the finger movement required to press a letter and what happened. That is the feeling of the letter on the keyboard. It's quite possible that these learned associations between the goal of typing a particular letter on the keyboard and the feeling of what that feels like could be very important for your typing ability. Those associations might actually guide and facilitate your typing ability. An implication here is that touching the keyboard and feeling it is very important for typing, especially for typists who learn to rely on feedback from the keys. So both of these alternatives are about different ideas about what's going on cognitively in a particular situation. You might have a map in your head that's guiding your finger movement, or maybe you're just learning associations between typing individual letters and what that feels like on your fingers. And this is important for typing. Both of these ideas have different implications about whether feedback from the keyboard 
is actually necessary for typing. So this leads into the third letter of Comrie, the logic. These different alternatives we've been talking about have different internal logic. The logic identifies how an experiment design might allow you to distinguish somehow between these two alternatives. So for example, um, can we come up with some general logic statements that have a form of this if then. So if alternative one idea is correct, then when we do something, participants should behave in a certain way. Um, this is kind of what we're going after. So if you can identify the alternative, so here's alternative one, here's alternative two. Let's see if we can generate some logic statements about um, each of those alternatives. Let's start off with alternative number one, A1. We'll walk you through this. If typists use an internal cognitive map that does not require feedback from the keyboard to guide their fingers, then typing performance should not be influenced by manipulations that remove tactile feedback such as typing on keys versus a flat surface. Consider the second alternative. This is the one where typists learn associations between keys and what they feel like. So if typists use feedback from the keyboard to guide their fingers, then typing performance should be influenced by manipulations that remove tactile feedback such as typing on keys versus a flat surface. I've anticipated here the fourth thing, which is the methods of the paper. The methods describe the procedures and experimental design that are going to implement a test of these, log of these logic statements. In general, the method section should state what the independent variable is, that is the manipulation in the experiment, as well as the dependent variable, that's what is measured. It also describes other things like who the participants were, how they were divided into groups, what were the materials, stimuli, design, apparatus, all these other things. So as an example, if you were to read the methods of my paper, you would see the major manipulation involved typing on different keyboards. Typists could have typed on a regular keyboard like this one with these normal buttons you might be used to on a PC. If you take a, a keyboard apart, you could have people type on these little rubber buttons underneath the keys. You could also take this layer off and have people type on the circuit board. That's a flat surface. We also got access to a laser projection keyboard so that people could type on a table. And we did this before iPads were out. So, or at least before I had one anyway. I can't remember when the iPads came out. The point of these methods are to manipulate systematically the kind of tactile feedback that typists would receive from the keyboard. The question was, would this influence typing performance? So this leads into the R section of Comrie, the results. Here you're trying to identify the outcome or findings from the experiment. So did the di different groups or different conditions produce different Per patterns of performance? What were the patterns of performance? What was the results? Were the results reliable? We could look at graphs, tables, statistics, and all sorts of things used to show the data. We could take a quick look at the graph from the paper, and let's see if we can inspect this a little bit. As a general statement, I will tell you that the typists were fastest and most accurate on the regular keyboard. 
and they were always slower and less accurate on the keyboards with less tactile feedback. We've got reaction times. That's how fast you are to start typing a letter at the first letter of a word. We've got these IKSIs. That stands for inter keystroke interval. That's how fast you are in between typing different letters. We also have error rate. So if we zoom in here, look at the regular keys keyboard, your reaction times were the fastest. This is in milliseconds, so lower is faster. The fastest for the regular keyboard and they were slower for the other kinds of keyboards. When we look at another measure of speed, again, faster for the regular keyboard and slower for the other ones. When we look at error rates, this is uh, fewer is better. So lower numbers are better, fewer errors were made for the regular keyboard and more errors were made for the other keyboards. So when you're reading a paper, if you were to flip back to the paper here, you might be going through experiment one, you might see the graph in the paper, you might read through the results and discussion here. Your goal when you're reading any paper is to try to extract the central findings. So for example, that you could produce a relatively straightforward sentence like this that summarizes the major results. Now, what do we do with the results? This gets to the very last letter in Calmry. This is the inferences. This is critical for every research uh, project. What is critical is um, whether or not the results of the experiment can tell us something about the alternative explanations under consideration. Ideally, a well-designed study might be able to eliminate one of the alternative hypotheses or provide new insight into one of the hypotheses. So here's an example of making an inference from the result back to one of the original explanations under consideration. Remember we had one of our alternative hypotheses was the idea that people could have some kind of internal cognitive map of the keyboard. This idea suggested that if you manipulate how the keyboard feels, that shouldn't really influence typing performance very much. People's internal map would just tell people's fingers where to go and it wouldn't matter how the keyboard felt. However, the result of the research clearly showed that reducing tactile feedback from the keyboard, it mattered. It caused slower and more error-prone typing. So what inference can we make? One inference that's possible here is that typists do not rely upon an internal map of the keyboard, especially one that doesn't use feedback from what the keyboard feels like. This kind of inference could help us think about or motivate thinking about different explanations about this cognitive ability. There's many more things we can add on to the last section of inferences. We can consider potential problems with the experiment that could have explained the results. For example, maybe people typed a little bit more slowly or made more errors because those other weird keyboards didn't work quite as well as a regular keyboard. We could examine potential problems during data collection. We can consider next steps or follow-up research ideas. So there's lots of ways to continue with the research questions by um, moving on to other ones that address uh, other parts of the bigger questions. So here's a summary. When you go and obtain a research article, uh, you could use the Calmy method to orient yourself towards the major components of that article you're looking for the questions. What are the broad and specific questions in the paper? You're looking for alternative hypotheses. 
uh, or explanations about those questions. You're looking for the logic of how those explanations work along with how that logic can be tested in an experimental design. Once you understand the logic of the experimental design, you should be looking for what results did that design produce? What was the pattern of data that was obtained? Finally, what kinds of inferences about the hypotheses can be made based on the pattern of results that were observed in the experiment. So if you can answer all of these things after reading a research article, pat yourself on the back. You've done a good job of extracting some of the central ideas and themes from the paper. So what's next? You could continue with the readings, watching the other mini lecture for this learning module. If you're finished, then go ahead and take the quiz. If you wanna try out a calmery exercise, then go ahead and complete the assignment for this module that asks you to find a research paper in cognition and try to write a calmery for it. All right, see you next time. Thanks again.